So thank you very much for inviting me at this very exciting and interesting uh, conference or workshop. Uh, and I will start with uh, with presenting our work regarding the adaptive characteristics in in immune responses. And of course, my my presentation is heavy in immunological data, but hopefully in the discussion part, we will see what uh, what the consequences from a conceptual point of view might be of these data. And I made a a summary of uh, of work that we have done in 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 the last approximately uh, ten years, and I tried to present especially the concepts and summarize those data rather than go in all the details of of the experimental facts, but. I would be very happy to give also the details of the methodology and so on if people are interested. Um, I will present more data in depth only uh, in the in the part on the cross-generational uh, transmission of resistance to infections. Now the question is, why would we be interested in trying to understand adaptation in innate immunity? Because uh, in all the immunology book, we have learned that actually the only part which adapts uh, to a previous encounter with a pathogen or with an infection and so on is uh, is the, what we call adaptive uh, immune responses, which are lymphocytes, B and T cells. They uh, they build immunological memory. So how how why would we be interested to see whether there is adaptation also in innate immune cells? And we were interested of that uh, of that because. In the last uh, 20 years or so, we have tried to understand also the responses to vaccination in tuberculosis, and we have worked with uh, with Basil Kalmet Geren, which is the own, still unfortunately the only vaccines uh, vaccine against tuberculosis. But during our work with with BCG, we have observed and learned some old studies that have been done almost 100 years ago, which showed actually that at the moment that BCG started to be used in the population to to vaccinate the children it induced a very strong decrease in the overall mortality of the children. And this is one of the one of the first studies that showed that, which was published in 1932 by Karl Neslund, who introduced BCG in Sweden. And what he observed, and this was before the time of antibiotics when a lot of children died of infections, he observed that actually mortality due to, uh, the general mortality in the group of children between zero and four years of age decreased after introduction of BCG from approximately 11% to 4%. And he could not explain this reduction of, of mortality due to tuberculosis because that was responsible for less than 1% of the deaths. And he observed that especially other types of respiratory tract infections and neonatal sepsis was also strongly uh, decreased in these children. And this observation was made many times that BCG was introduced in various populations. And this is a systematic review um, uh, performed by the WHO SAGE group who looked during uh, during the epidemiological uh, studies in the last 100 years and they observed everything which is on the left side of this of this vertical line is actually in the advantage of BCG so decreased mortality and they observed a lot of studies in a lot of epidemiological studies decrease in overall mortality and there were also a small number of randomized trial actually which showed the same thing so we were interested in that and to try to understand is it true that BCG can actually protect against another type of infection and we wanted to reproduce that in a model of um, of controlled infection in humans. Now, of course, it's very difficult to infect somebody. Uh, we cannot do that. But what we can do is to give another type of vaccine with a live, live attenuated microorganism and use that as an infection. For example, yellow fever vaccination uses an attenuated virus. And the yellow fever uh, vaccine virus is an attenuated uh, form of the yellow fever virus which gives us a viremia for almost one week, basically. Um, um, we, When we are vaccinated, actually, we undergo a very mild infection. And we, we can assess the number of viruses in the circulation by doing a PCR from the blood. So what we, do, what we have done then is to take, uh, to ask two groups of volunteers, one received BCG, the other one placebo, and everybody received yellow fever vaccine one month later. And we assessed actually the viremia in the circulation of these vaccinated individuals uh, one month later. You can see that on day three, uh, on day three and seven after the yellow fever vaccine, 
Well, there were very few, this is a, a relative iremia in, in a logarithmic scale. There were very few viruses actually in the circulation. Most of it here was too early here. They were eliminated by the host um, uh, immune response. But on day five, almost everybody had viruses in the circulation. And the BCG vaccinated individuals had significantly less viruses compared with a placebo administered individuals. So basically, in this very mild model of viral infection, BCG could protect against viremia. Despite the fact that, that the virus numbers were lower, the actual antibody titers against yellow fever was perfectly normal uh, 90, uh, 90 days later. So basically antigen presentation, induction of the adaptive immune responses of antibody, a serological response was perfectly fine. But this demonstrated actually that we can protect against a, a different type of infection with BCG. Now the question is, how is that, uh, how is that possible? Because what we have learned for a lot, uh, for many years, is that adaptive immunity, T and B cells, are those which are responsible for the immunological memory. They are responsible to improve the response against a certain infection after the vaccine, and they, uh, they, give, uh, they give protection. Now, the only problem in explaining the effects of, uh, of BCG by T and B cells is that these responses are antigen dependent. So they are specific for a certain, uh, for a certain pathogen, and this cannot explain properly, actually, the, uh, the non-specific type of protection that was induced uh, by BCG against other types of infections. So then we were interested, would it be possible that innate immune responses, which respond in an antigen independent way, could also change after the initial vaccination or after an infection? And this could explain the improved responsiveness the second time. <laughs> now, in order to do that, actually we tested it and we performed the same type of experiments with vaccinated individuals with BCG. And then we tested the function of innate immune cells before and after BCG vaccination. And now not only with mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is a mycobacteria, the specific stimulus compared with, with BCG, which is mycobacterium bovis, but also with, with non-related pathogens such as Staphylococcus aureus, a gram-positive bacteria, or Candida albicans, which is a fungus. And we observed that the monocyte production of pro-inflammatory cytokines was also increased after BCG vaccination. So you can observe here. So it changed basically. And how is it possible at molecular level that this uh, took place? And what we have observed was the following. There is a very strong rearrangement of the chromatin architecture after the BCG vaccination and actually after vaccines as well, other vaccines as well, and after, uh, after infections also. What is happening is the following. If we have a naive uh, innate immune cell, such as naive macrophage or monocytes and so on, in the genes, in, in the regions which encode for genes important for host defense, there is no gene transcription because that is not necessary. And the chromatin is in, in, is in a closed conformation uh, state. The transcription factors cannot bind to the promoters. There is no gene transcription. Now, when we get an infection, there is uh, uh, there are chemical changes that are taking place in the histones of the, of, the, of the nucleosomes from the chromatin, acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, and so on. And that determines the relaxation of the conformation of the chromatin. The transcription factors can bind to the promoters and they in induce uh, gene transcription. So it's like opening the book, reading, well, what should I do if I have an infection and I have to make cytokines and defensins and chemokines and so on. Now, after we eliminate the infection, we always thought all these chemical changes are lost. The chromatin goes back to the uh, closed chromatin uh, conformation in the resting state. And that is partially true because uh, gene transcription does stop. And a lot of these, uh, these changes in the histones are indeed lost, but not all of them. It's like book, putting a bookmark in the, in the book, closing the book because it's very difficult to, to move around with an open book. You close it, but you put also a, a bookmark at the right place that, uh, so you know next time when you encounter an infection where to open the book, and read the instruction what to do during the infection. And during this reinfection, all these conformational changes that took place here are easier to take place. They, they are quicker and, and stronger, and they will lead subsequently after the second infection to an increased responsiveness, enhanced host defense, 
and better, uh, uh, better outcome of the infection. Now, that would be nice if it would work nicely all the time in, in the good way. And you would say, well, if this is the case, you, we should be resistant to everything all the time just by getting one infection. But that is not the case, obviously, for two reasons. One reason is that not everything which is ideal is happening at that time. We are bookmarking during the first infection some, some genes, but not necessarily all of them that will be necessary during the second infection. If the second infection needs more genes that are necessary or different genes, then the first infection do, does not necessarily mean it will protect. If we are lucky, for example, and precisely the same genes or at least some of the genes needed here are needed also the second time, then we get a protection, partial protection or even uh, a stronger protection. That is one thing. And the other thing is that these changes are not happening in N differentiation cells. And I will uh, talk to you a little bit later about that, but in progenitor cells. And they are lost with times and different things that we encounter during our lifetime send these changes in one direction or the others, and we can lose these bookmarks. Sometimes you open the book and, and the bookmark falls down, basically, and, and you lose it. So in the, end, uh, in the end, it's not complete. Now, we were also interested to try to understand which are the regions of the, of the DNA which are bookmarked during such an infection or vaccination. And what we have observed, basically, by studying um, these bookmarks of open chromatin, these uh, markers uh, of open chromatin, which is monomethylation of lysine 4 of histone 3, or trimethylation of lysine 4 of histone 3, or acetylation of lysine 27 of histone 3, we observed a couple of things. First of all, we are bookmarking genes which are necessary for direct host defense responses, inflammation, interleukins, integrins, and so on, which is logical. But at the same time, we are also bookmarking uh, genes which are very important for cellular metabolism. And why is that happening? Because cellular metabolism rewiring is an essential, essential component of these changes, long-term changes thing, that take place in the cell. What, what do I mean by that? For example, if the cell is stimulated through pattern recognition receptors, which are recognizing non-cells, so things that are not our cells, they induce stimulation inside the innate immune cells through PI3X mTOR pathway, which activates transcription factors such as HIF1 alpha. And that is very important for rewiring of cellular, uh, cellular metabolism. Uh, the, the glycolysis is strongly upregulated, and that is needed for ATP production because the Krebs cycle is no longer used catabolically to produce ATP, but is used anabolically. Citrate is extracted from the Krebs cycle, forms acetyl-CoA, which on the one hand is a donor of acetyl group for histone acetyl transferases for, uh, for these processes, but on the other hand also enters the lipid synthesis and cholesterol synthesis pathway. One of these metabolites is mevalonate, and this mevalonate provides an amplification loop of these processes with the IGF-1 receptor. On the other hand, amino acids replenish the Krebs cycle through glutamine, glutamate, alpha ketoglutarate is here, leads to accumulation of certain metabolites such as fumarate. And fumarate inhibits histone demethylases. These are the enzymes which take away these bookmarks on the DNA. But by inhibiting them through increase of the fumarate, we enable that these, uh, that these histone marks persist for, uh, for a long time. So there is an integration between uh, immunological signaling, changes in the, in the cellular metabolism, and long-term epigenetic processes in the cells. Now, what I mentioned to you, we, we've done these studies by taking blood from the, uh, from the circulation of people, just from their vein, two weeks and three months after BCG, even one year after the BCG. And we saw these changes. But how can we explain that these changes are there? Because the cells in the circulation, monocytes, for example, are in the circulation for one or two or three days. How is it possible that three months later or one year later, we see this type of changes in the circulation? The only possible explanation is if BCG vaccination in our case would induce similar type of changes in the bone marrow, so in the progenitors of the, of the immune cells. And for that, we performed a new study in which we asked people that they donate not only blood, but also the bone marrow aspirate before and after BCG, and they kindly uh, did that. We assessed their immunological function, which was again increased, 
But then we purified hematopoietic stem cells from the bone marrow, and we assess the transcriptional program in these hematopoietic stem cells. And what we have observed is that three months after BCG vaccination, when BCG was long gone from the site of the infection, it was also not present in the bone marrow or in the circulation. But we have observed a very strong change in the transcriptional program of these, uh, of these uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells after the BCG vaccination with a very strong bias towards myelopoiesis and granulopoiesis. And we observe that the daughter cells of these hematopoietic stem cells uh, thereafter, they are shifted towards an increased uh, uh, myeloid function. We also asked ourselves, okay, so apparently there are changes taking place in the bone marrow. Now, the other question that we asked ourselves is, okay, if we induce these changes in the monocyte population, for example, or other innate in populations, are these changes taking place identically in all the cells? Or do we have also certain subpopulations of cells in the circulation in the way that they react after the BCG vaccination. So in order to study that, we purified human primary monocytes. We exposed them to BCG, but also to other stimuli that induce what we call train immunity. For one day, then we washed them. We let them stay for, uh, uh, and rest for five days, and then we re-stimulated them with LPS on day six. And then we, after four hours, we performed single cell RNA sequencing. To, to see that, transcriptional changes after stimulation at single cell level. So to make a long story short, we have observed indeed that there is heterogeneity in the way that the cells respond. So we took as, um, first as, as um, uh, uh, biomarkers of train immunity, chemokines and pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are produced by these, uh, by these trained cells. And what we have observed is the following. There was a certain subpopulation of, of monocytes, approximately 25% of them, who did not respond better upon restimulation compared with what they did before BCG exposure. So basically what we call them were non-trainable. That doesn't mean that they didn't respond to LPS stimulation. They did, but they respond, responded in the, same, in the same way as before the exposure to LPS. Then we had another population of approximately 25% of the monocytes, which responded after the BCG exposure with increased production of chemokines, such as CXCL9, 10, 11. We call them monocytes producing chemokines. And then we had approximately half of the cells, which produce not, not only more chemokines, but also more pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as R1, R6, DNF, and so on. This type of this subpopulation of cells had nothing to do with the classical way in which we separate the monocytes in CD4 and CD16 monocytes. All these three subpopulations could be found in the in the in the classical uh, in the classical monocyte subpopulation. And then we extracted actually the transcriptional programs from each of these uh, of these subpopulations, and we looked whether they are. They can be found, these transcriptional programs, in different diseases. For example, we identified them in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. But then we studied also uh, patients with, with COVID-19. And this is a database which was published independent of us by colleagues in, uh, in, um, in Germany. And they published it two years ago in Cell. And what we have observed by analyzing the single cell transcriptional data from these patients is that Patients with mild COVID-19, they could build properly the monocyte responses, the train immunity transcriptional programs in the monocyte. But people with severe COVID-19, they were unable to do that. These transcriptional programs were defective in their monocyte. So what we hypothesize is, is the following. If somebody is at home and they are not sick yet, they don't even know that they were infected. If they respond with high innate immune responses, they inhibit the growth of the virus in our case, but this can be also true for other types of, of, of infections. This would result in low pathogen load uh, at systemic level, low systemic inflammation, low symptoms and survival. However, if that, if, if, if that person responds poorly in the beginning, when they are not sick yet, but they respond poorly, they let the pathogen multiply, they induce high viremia, that will uh, lead to high in inflammatory systemic reaction, which is now deleterious, high severity of the disease and death. 
So one possibility is, well, probably this is exactly what is happening in, in, uh, with BCG vaccination. And we actually saw precisely this in our study with yellow fever, uh, yellow fever vaccination, in which the individuals with, uh, with BCG vaccination after the yellow fever vaccine actually had lower systemic inflammation compared with, uh, uh, with the placebo individuals. And that's why we performed a couple of trials to see whether we can improve actually the responsiveness and protect uh, the individuals again uh, against real infections. This is a study that we performed actually before the uh, the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic that was done in two thousand eighteen nineteen and the beginning of twenty twenty, in which uh, in which we revaccinated together with colleagues from the University of Athens. We revaccinated elderly at high risk of infections with either BCG or a placebo. They were randomized. And then we followed them for one year and, and assessed the total number of infections. And we observed that actually uh, they had approximately 40% less infections in the BCG vaccinated group. Because of that, we thought maybe this is true also for, uh, for COVID-19 in the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, this hypothesis has been tested also in animal models. This is one example uh, published uh, last year by the group of Alan Scher in, in um, uh, ACE2 transgenic uh, 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 mice. And he observed indeed that BCG, when administered IV, induces a very strong protection against uh, COVID 19. And then we performed a similar type of study with revaccination in, uh, in a Greek population. And we observed indeed that if we revaccinate, and I'm pointing out revaccinate, why? Because these individuals had BCG vaccine at birth. And they were revaccinated and were 60 or, or, or more. And then we followed them up for, for six months and we observed actually that they were significantly protected. And last, uh, last week, actually, a similar study showed uh, the same effects in a population in India. However, when we performed the same study with first vaccination in the elderly individuals in a population of Northern Europe in, in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, we did not observe any difference. This is a large study, 6,000 volunteers. Um, these are also elderly above 60 years of age, and they, uh, they received their first BCG vaccination because BCG was not given in the Netherlands, but this was not able to protect against, uh, against the total number of COVID-19 infections. This was disappointing. However, when we assessed actually the cellular and, and humoral responses, against SARS-CoV-2 in the individuals which in the end received, uh, uh, received uh, um, were infected with COVID-19, we observed that actually individuals who were vaccinated with BCG had higher uh, serological response and cellular response uh, uh, to the virus. And, and that, uh, that observation was repeated actually by colleagues studying the effect of BCG on either uh, either the uh, the messenger RNA vaccines or on uh, adeno adenoviral vaccines for AstraZeneca, this is a study done with uh, BCG given as uh, let's say booster of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, and you can see the neutralization titers of against SARS-CoV-2 vaccines are much better if people got one month earlier a BCG vaccine. And a similar study has been very recently published by colleagues in UK and India who have done the same stu uh, study, but instead of using uh, the messenger RNA vaccine, they used the uh, adenovirus uh, vaccine from AstraZeneca, Oxford. Uh, and they have observed also that if people uh, uh, were uh, BCG revaccinated before receiving the, the COVID shield vaccine, they had better uh, cellular and serological responses. So we hypothesize maybe maybe even even if we do not see a protection against against the total number of infection, maybe these better immunological responses protect the people against severity. And we assessed actually severity in in our study in the Netherlands, and we have seen indeed fifteen percent less hospitalizations in the BCG group. And actually, we looked also at influenza uh, diagnosis, and we have observed uh, also a significantly. Uh, uh, less um, less influenza infection, actually, which is in line with the previous observation. And it might be possible that BCG actually protects better against influenza than COVID. When we looked also at mortality, which is in the end probably the most important uh, outcome of, um, of uh, severity, we, have, we did not have enough power 
to see a significant difference. Fortunately, that means that not, not enough people died, which is, which is obviously very good. But still, we have observed that in the BCG group, there were uh, 13 deaths compared with, uh, with 18 in the, in, the, in the control group, which led to approximately 30% reduction in mortality. This was not statistically significant, but when we performed summary statistics of all the studies that are currently known uh, with, with data on mortality, and we put all the deaths together in the two groups, PCG and placebo, we have observed that there were a, was approximately 40% reduction in total mortality in the BCG vaccinated individuals. However, this is summary statistics for more studies. So in order to be sure that this is true, this should have been done in a much larger study with, with enough power to see effects on mortality. But obviously this is not possible to be done right now because we have uh, other vaccines. Interestingly, these were all studies done with one injection of BCG. There is only one study which was done actually in the United States in which they administered three BCG vaccines at an interval of six months. And with that scheme, they observed a 92% protection against, against COVID-19, also against total number of infections. However, this study is small and it should be repeated to see whether we can, we can validate uh, this observation. It is not only the BCG vaccines which shows these non-specific effects. We were interested also in, in the effects of influenza vaccination because influenza vaccination is administered on large scale and it has been reported to have some uh, non-specific effects. And we followed up actually the employees of our hospital. Unfortunately, not everybody gets uh, B, uh, influenza vaccine when they are offered, so approximately 50% of our employees got it and 50% didn't. But in both uh, the first and the second wave of the, of the COVID-19, when we, when we follow them up, we observe 40 to 50% less COVID-19 uh, infections in the, in the people who got, uh, who got influenza vaccine. However, we should be aware this is an observational study and not a randomized study. So maybe the people who went to get their influenza vaccine are also the people who wear masks, uh, take care of all the other measures more carefully. However, that being said, there was a beautiful paper by uh, Bali Pulendran uh, last year in South showing actually that, that influenza vaccines also induced uh, uh, through epigenetic uh, reprogramming a, pr a program of antiviral vigilance, which can protect uh, uh, most likely heterogeneously. And there was very recently also a very large epidemiological study in 30,000 healthcare workers in Qatar, which also showed approximately 30% protection uh, with influenza uh, vaccination against, uh, against COVID-19. All in all, what I wanted to show you is that uh, certain vaccines, and it's not only influenza and BCG, but also similar studies have been done for uh, measles containing vaccines and oral polio vaccine. And actually the old variola vaccine seems to have uh, also similar type of non-specific effects. And these non-specific effects could be eventually used in a future pandemic with an unknown pathogen. Now it's not no longer necessary because we have specific vaccines which obviously give better protection. So we don't need to use our BCG or whatever uh, for COVID-19. But if we would have in the future a new pathogen for which we do not have yet a vaccine, until we design a new vaccine, produce it, test it and so on, uh, distribute and so on, which take one, one and a half years in the best case scenario, as we have seen, what we can do is to do very quickly phase three clinical trials with some of these uh, vaccines inducing non-specific effects. And if one of them induce even, induces even 30 or 40% reduction in morbidity or mortality and hospitalizations and so on, that can be used as bridge vaccination until the specific vaccines are produced to reduce the impact of a, of a pandemic. Now, I still have time, right? Uh, yeah, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Oh. Now, the next, the next question that we asked ourselves was, okay, if we see these non-specific effects induced, uh, epigenetic effects induced at the level of bone marrow, and this transmits to the, uh, to the following generation of immune cells through mitosis, would it be possible that this type of protection can be induced also across generations? And of course, here is much more difficult because this should be induced across meiosis, which is a very, very different process, which generally is believed to 
uh, to erase basically all the epigenetic changes. But that is theoretical, whereas actual, actual studies have shown in plants and non-vertebrates that there is uh, a transmission of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of resistance to infection across generation. And in plants, for example, also the mechanism has been shown is epigenetic in nature, and it transmits, the, it transmits this resistance up to uh, five generations. And this is, for example, also uh, from a review, these are very, various groups of, of, uh, of invertebrates in which transmission of cross-generational resistance to infection has been shown in, uh, in experimental studies. Moreover, very interestingly, there were some, uh, there were studies showing in humans that, uh, uh, that there, uh, especially in the Netherlands, for example, there was a, 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 a hunger winter in, in 44, 45, where the population did not have enough to eat and so on. And people have shown that the children of these individuals had much more metabolic disturbances compared with uh, uh, with uh, with uh, comparator uh, 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 individuals, and they have also observed long-term cross-generational transmission of certain epigenetic traits. So we asked ourselves: all this data would it be possible? Because obviously we did not evolve such uh, such. Uh, cross-generational transmission of traits just to give us problems, for example, uh, metabolic uh, um, uh, problems, but to protect us against something. And of course, infections are uh, a number one, uh, a number one candidate, let's say, for uh, for this protection. And what we have done is to, um, uh, to infect, infect male mice with a sublethal uh, doses of candida albicans in our case, let the mice very easily recover because it was a very mild infection. And then we bred them with, with healthy females. And the same we have done with control mice. And then their progeny, we started to expose them to different types of, uh, uh, different types of infections. And we have observed actually protection in four different models. We have observed protection against against an E. coli peritonitis model. We have observed uh, um, uh, protection against candida albicans infection. We have observed also changes in the, at, the, at the level of bone marrow and the way in which, in which these, uh, these mice responded to infections. The amount of microorganisms upon infection of the, of the progeny with candida, the amount of uh, fungal load was significantly decreased, as you can see here, in kidney and liver. Um, in Spain, we did not uh, uh, reach statistical significance, but the the tendency is also uh, also the same. We have done that also in an endotoxemia model in which we observe that actually these individuals uh, react with improved responsiveness uh, upon LPS uh, uh, injection, this, uh, this progeny. And we have also, this is a, uh, a study separately done in, in the group of Thierry Roger, in which uh, instead of candida, he gave uh, zymosin, and then we he infected the mice with, with listeria, and he observed also protection against listeria in the in the next generation. So apparently, there is uh, there is uh, there is an effect. Although I have to say we repeated that in three different laboratories, but one of them did not was not able to uh, to reproduce these data. Uh, the colleagues from uh, Masdi van Gaghi. So apparently, there are also changes in the local situation, local microbiome, which influence uh, uh, these uh, uh, these effects. All in all, uh, we have observed also that uh, uh, that the effects are transmitted through uh, through immunological mechanisms at the bone marrow uh, progenitor level, where we see differences in in both numbers and transcriptional programs. Other, other, other studies in parallel with us and independently have shown that also, also sepsis models such as sickle ligation and puncture uh, also induce uh, these changes in the progeny with the progeny of mice recovering from the CLP model also uh, displaying uh, uh, differences in their, in their immune responses. Finally, uh, do we see this in humans also? And there is a beautiful study that was published last year uh, by the group of uh, Peter Arby and Christina Stavo Ben, in which they have observed actually that in the, uh, the children with fathers that have a, a BCG scar, 
they have lower mortality compared with children of fathers without a paternal BCG score. So meaning that apparently the, uh, uh, the type of immune system that your father had apparently influences the way that you can uh, deal with infection as a, as a child, which, uh, which epidemiologically supports the hypothesis that indeed this resistance against infection can be transmitted across generation. So all in all, what I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to present to you is, is the fact that, that there is uh, adaptation within innate immune responses after infections, after vaccinations, we call that trained immunity. This is mediated by epigenetic and metabolic processes, which lead to an increased responsiveness. And this contributes together with other types of, uh, of resistance mechanisms to the resistance against, uh, against infections, including, of course, the, uh, the, the TMB cells responses that are very important, uh, including also genetic resistance and including also uh, uh, inter-infection uh, interference. Now, in the last uh, two minutes, I would like also to make one final point. If we look, if we look at, at all the organisms on Earth, uh, starting from our last common uh, 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 ancestor, then we have bacteria, plants, and animals, and so on. And we observe all these, all these organisms, we will see that, that um, Adaptive immunity based on TMB cells are present only in the vertebrates, basically, which represent maybe one to two percent of all the diversity on Earth. And all the others have only innate immune, uh, immunity. And the question is can we envisage a situation in which 99% actually of, uh, of all species on Earth would not have immunological memory, which is evolutionarily speaking, very obviously advantageous to have because it decreases basically mortality against repeated bouts of, uh, of infection. Even more, if we look also at the, uh, at the presence of, of antigens in, the, in, this, uh, uh, in all these uh, animals and group of organisms, we observe that many pattern recognition receptors, if not all, are present uh, in all in all group of animals, um, whereas jawless vertebrates and jaw, uh, jawed vertebrates they have uh, they have developed uh, the TMB cell uh, responses, and they are also in the jawless vertebrates evolved immune memory in a secondary, different uh, different way uh, using uh, VLR uh, VLR uh, VLR. Uh, 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 receptors. So that would mean that if immunological memory has evolved only in TMB cells that evolved independently twice basically in the vertebrates, but it would not have evolved in invertebrates at all. But that would be very strange, uh, evolutionarily speaking. And we look, and if we look at all the experiments that have been done in both plants and invertebrates and so on, there are a lot of these species in which it has been demonstrated that if you infect an organism, a plant, for example, or an insect with a certain uh, with a certain infection, if that organism recovers, it becomes more resistant to that or to different uh, types of organisms. So there is an extensive work showing the presence of innate immunological memory in 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 the tree of life, basically, as you can observe here. Finally, I would like also, uh, we, we made a hypothesis that actually the immunological memory properties have developed um, uh, sequentially. If we think of how immunological memory acts in us in humans or in vertebrates, uh, uh, let's say, we have, we have two different components of, of our immunological uh, uh, memory response. One is the amplitude of the response. We respond better, but we also respond specific uh, uh, specific to a certain types of pathogen. And this amplitude is built based on epigenetic uh, processes. And it is true not only for monocytes, dendritic cells, neutrophils, and so on, which are in innate immune responses, but these epigenetic changes take place also in TMB cells when they respond adaptively. Because gene rearrangement, which is important for specificity, which is immunoglobulin-based or VLR-based in, in the vertebrates, that gives specificity, but not an increase in the amplitude. So the proposal that we made is that the amplitude of the recall response, the improved amplitude of the host defense 
has evolved first is a very primitive, non-specific form of, of immunological memory, whereas, whereas specificity-based, for example, or immunoglobulins or VLR receptors have evolved later, and they, uh, uh, they gave also specificity to certain types of specialized cells. Now, it seems here that there, are, there is no specificity here, but I'm not that sure, actually. I, I do think that there are undiscovered uh, properties of specificity also in, in other types of animals, and a, a lot of work needs to be done there, because I cannot imagine that specificity evolved only here, but of course we study the vertebrates because we are ourselves vertebrates, and we like ourselves more. Uh, Yes, so finally, I wanted to uh, to show you that that infections in general, but due to time, I don't have time to go into the maladaptive states. Um, they induce long-term changes in innate immune responses as well. This is, uh, this is uh, um, uh, mediated at epigenetic level. I talked about histone modifications, but changes have been shown in DNA methylation, in non-coding RNA, such as microRNA, low non-coding RNA, and so on. And these changes lead to, are meant to lead to adaptive states. For example, tolerance programs are meant to lead to mucosal tolerance, to limit tissue damage during infection, and training programs to improve innate immune maturation, response to infections, and so on. But if these processes are inappropriately, activa inappropriately activated at the wrong time, wrong place, and so on, they can also lead to maladaptive states. So tolerance program can lead to, uh, to immunosuppression in sepsis or in cancer. Or train immunity program can lead to hyperinflammation in tissues, atherosclerosis, uh, inflammatory diseases, and so on. And finally, I would like uh, to thank you, but also the colleagues who performed all the studies in our group, also the group from Hank Stunemer, with whom we did a lot of epigenetic studies, colleagues from Dresden, McGill, and Bonn, with whom we did uh, uh, bone marrow studies in mouse and humans. Uh, colleagues in Mount Sinai with whom we have a, um, a program of transcriptional uh, um, um, to, to bring uh, to bring to the patients these uh, these findings um, and and the other colleagues with whom we do clinical studies. Thank you very much. So we have about 30 minutes uh, for questions. There are some people on Zoom. I see that they're uh, raising their hands, but I would like to first take questions from the audience here. And if there is an issue with the audience, because the microphone should be picking up uh, stuff from the room, then please uh, the people on the Zoom are uh, working out. So I saw the first uh, was part. Okay. Thank you. Can I just ask the question or should I take a uh, microphone? Try and ask a question on the I, I can repeat eventually the question okay. on the microphone. So thank you very much for the fascinating talk. I think it has like profound philosophical uh, uh, implications, not only immunological actually. So my first question is is the following: because since like during the inflammatory response, non cells are also participating in the process, right? Epithelial cells, normal cells, they all have to be somehow uh, adjusted to the situation. Did you also see this kind of priming, this kind of uh, epigenetic programming in this kind of cells as well? So that's that's not one question. And the second question is this: Would you consider uh, the following that, for example, what is memory in uh, like the memory, the psychological memory, right? Is the change in the connectivity of neurons? So perhaps I was just hypothesizing here, and I don't know if you thought about it and tested it. Uh, my question is this: Perhaps uh, this kind of memory that you observe it could be also a kind of change in connectivity between like the actually the network. Of immune of innate immune cells in the sense that, for example, here you have a uh, primary release of some pro-inflammatory cytokine, and the receptor for this for this cytokine is also upregulated, for example, to enforce this kind of connection. And, and then maybe if you look at it at the systemic level, we, what we see actually is a kind of specific memory, and not as one could think unspecific, because we, we look at the single cells, we may seem specific, but if you look at the systemic kind of memory, maybe there's a kind of Actually, part of the brain and the use. So, so these are the two questions. And again, I, I thought it was fascinating. And thank you very much. So, I will I will repeat just to be sure that the question I will start with the first question whether there are these type of uh, memory processes taking place also in non-immune cells. We have not studied ourselves, but other colleagues have done that. 
and they have served indeed that that is the case. So, for example, the group of Elaine Fuchs in, in New York has done beautiful work in, in showing that there is an, what she called inflammatory memory, but which is based also on epigenetic reprogramming, precisely the same uh, process taking place in epithelial cell progenitors, and then ensuring actually, for example, improved, uh, improved repair. Uh, other people have shown that also uh, taking place in endothelial cells. And that is true, basically. That this is such an old type of mechanism in which, in which something happens to a cell and anything which leads to a transcriptional change, production of something, has an epigenetic basis in itself because otherwise it cannot take place. And it is very easy to, to imagine that it's very likely that not everything goes per perfectly back to normal. So there will be a scar of that encounter, whatever happens, basically. Whether that's, that scar uh, is important uh, functionally, that is, that is the second question. And sometimes it is not, probably, and it seems like the cells are completely the same as previously. But sometimes it does, and we see in innate immune cells, other people have shown in epithelial cells, endothelial cells, that that is the case. And sometimes these processes are used and have evolved to, to help us in, in host defense or, or in uh, normal physiology. So my answer to that is yes. Now, the second question is whether, well, uh, immunological uh, uh, memory in the brain, for example, is the change in connectivity. And your question was, would it be possible that similar changes in connectivity take place also in the immune system? And the answer is absolutely yes, because, uh, because we, have in, we have continuous interaction uh, between immune cells, and that is taking place during the innate immune response, but also during the adaptive immune response between them together. Because, of course, we, we have done some of our studies, for example, in Reg1 deficient mice or in skid mice, just to prove conceptually that these changes can take place in innate immune cells. But in an actual organisms, where, organism where both are present, there is a continuous interaction between innate and immune response, uh, uh, innate and adaptive immune response. And uh, to give you an example, uh, well, antigen presentation is the obvious, well, what we call immunological synapse and so on, innate immune system connecting with the adaptive immune response. And a component of trained immunity can be considered, for example, adjuvanticity, improvement of antigen pres presentation is a function of innate immune cell, is a function of a trained cell but on the other hand, influences adaptive immune cells. But the other way around is also uh, true. We have done studies highly purifying monocytes or uh, uh, performing our experiments in human peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which is basically a mixture of all cell types. And we observed that the, that the long-term changes in the monocytes, for example, are much better if the entire immune system is present. And we and others have shown that actually uh, signals from the uh, from the T cells or NK cells, which produce interferon gamma, are crucial for the uh, the complete change or the most uh, efficient change, let's say, epigenetically and functionally in the innate immune cells. So this uh, this increased connectivity, let's say, if we want to call it, it's absolutely taking place. It can take place also cell, through cell to cell interactions through. Uh, 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 co-stimulatory molecules and so on, or at a distance through immunological signals that are provided by uh, cytokines, chemokines, and so on. Okay, let's try and uh, take a question from Zoom. So I see Rance Peters, if you can uh, unmute yourself. Okay, actually, uh, the question is written, so I can just read it out. Um, so, the, oh, okay. So it doesn't have a mic or uh, camera. So I was so the reading the question. I was wondering if cathode priming also work the other way around. So you alter the metabolic phenotype of a cell and try to force some histone modifications. Uh, yes, I'm not sure if I understand correctly whether. The other way around means, let's say, to lead to an inhibition of, uh, of immune function that happens also. For example, after after sepsis episodes, if if the infection is not moderate or is a vaccination but a very severe infection, it can lead to the opposite process. Uh, 
uh, metabolic processes which are induced in the cells actually take care that, that the transcription is strongly downregulated. And this downregulation can uh, can persist for, for weeks to months. That is also a reason, for example, why this immunosuppressive phenotype leads to increased susceptibility to infections up, up to three to nine months after a sepsis episode, for example. But I, I do think that uh, that that metabolites themselves can induce some of these uh, uh, can induce some of these processes that has been shown actually for for itaconate, for example, and for um, uh, for fumarate, that they can induce this type of uh, epigenetic changes by influencing the activity of uh, epigenetic enzymes. Okay, so then, um, yeah, plenty of time. So I, I saw the time I was, uh, um, yeah, I'm gonna make list. That's a wonderful talk, thank you very much. I have one question about train immunity. It seems to me that we could define train immunity as innate immune memory, or we could define it as innate immune memory associated with some specific epigenetic reprogramming. And that would have strong consequences on determining to what extent invertebrates and plants have trained immunity. So either the claim is that we find innate immune memory in invertebrates and plants, and this is one statement that does not require some specific mechanism. It can be open-minded in terms of how it's achieved, or we can say something like we're going to find the same kind of histone modification or DNA manipulation across the neurotype. So which of those definitions is yours? I mean, you don't have to decide, but which, which one would you prefer? Uh, I initially, initially, I prefer the one without, without the definition. But I was urged, indeed, by colleagues to, to put also the epigenetic part into it. But in the end, they are not so different after all, because any any function that results in a different gene transcription, which in the end is necessary for a different function, is by definition epigenetically mediated. So it's almost redundant to say is it epigenetic or not, because independently of any mechanism that would mediate it, in the end, it will have an epigenetic process leading to a gene transcription change. Yeah, so but, but if we want to to mention it, we can mention it. But there's a trade-off here. So the claim is much stronger if we are specific about mechanisms. I mean, it seems. Yeah, but let's say let's hypothesize what would be a potential mechanism which is non-epigenetically mediated that would lead to a change in function of a cell. How could that cell change its function without some epigenetic change? Well, that again makes the claim. Less well, biologically speaking, I don't know exactly how that would work. How is how would that be possible? Because in the end, change in function would mean change in transcription of some things, some enzymes which should do something, some processes. It would and by definition, that would involve an epigenetic change. Yeah. But, but in terms of causality, it would be very different. So you're know, saying that epigenetic changes are associated with a phenomenon is not. So no, 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 no. This is causality. Yeah. So, so this is causality. This is where this is where I think the more we can say what kind of epigenetic reprogramming is involved in training immunity. Ah, that is that is different. What kind of? Yeah. So this is what I'm kind of. The more we can say. Okay. If if we say well, it should have. Uh, let's say uh, chromatin uh, accessibility differences and certain mm -hmm. certain histones biomarkers, or should it be mediated by uh, by DNA methylation, or should it be production of certain low no coding RNAs, which are different? Those are all epigenetic processes. But if we say, well, train immunity should be uh, should be associated with chromatin accessibility change, then it's a very different thing than saying it's epigenetically mediated. Yeah. Uh, I would not want to put that. I, I would prefer actually to keep it to keep it open, because uh, because I do think that all these epigenetic processes work together, and I don't think that they are separated. I don't think that they are. You can completely separate. We we see ourselves. We have studied mostly chromatin accessibility, but so there is beautiful paper now coming uh, came out two or three months ago about DNA methylation in children after BCG vaccination, beautiful changes that we didn't look at, basically. So I wouldn't... Uh, so in the end, this is innate immune memory. In, in the end, this is what it is, because you're saying yeah. there will be some epigenetic changes. Well, what I'm saying by innate immune memory is very simple. Innate immune cells are not the same 
after they yeah, have you, seen an infection, yeah, basically. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Sophie. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Super interesting. So my question, I think, rests a bit on the distinction between specificity and reactivity. Because I think that's what you've beautifully shown for the intergenerational that are there's also a way that the reactivity towards other kinds of viruses is increased. But my problem rests with the intergenerational or transgenerational, and particularly what makes the effects you observe specifically an immune phenomenon. Because uh, I don't know, the persistence of histone modification is pretty tricky, right? Because uh, they exchange by proteins and so on and so forth. Why couldn't the phenomenon you're observing in the generation would just be due to some incident signaling, for example, so a general stress response thing and not an immune response thing. So why is it an immunological phenomenon? I'm not, I'm not saying that it is because we did not demonstrate basically that, the, that there is causality between the immunological changes that we observed and the resistance to, uh, to infection. The resistance to infection could have been caused indeed by a different a metabolic stress response or whatever. We did not demonstrate. We just saw there is a change in the susceptibility and there is a change in the immune, immune responses. Whether they are connected, actually, we did not. We did not uh, demonstrate it. What, what we should have done eventually is to use certain knockouts to show that it's the immune response that it's. But um, in the end, we decided to publish without that connection purely because of time, because it took us some seven years. <laughs> To, to just show in, in the different models everything and probably it would have taken another three or four at least to uh, to look at, at the causality, but you're right. So we don't know, but what we know is that both these processes, difference in susceptibility and different immune responses are present. Okay, go ahead. Uh, really great job. Uh, I'm, I'm... I'm an admirer of your work um, because from the time of Mexico and this kind of global I think your work is really um, still the highlight of innate immunity. And I think this is a, this is fantastic that innate immunity goes this way and really always discovering something new. So thank you for your work and for your presentation. I have a few uh, short questions. So you mentioned also the LR receptors triggering signaling actually leads to those changes in in uh, but the wild receptors can also be can recognize endogenous ligands. That's what right. really happen when they recognize endogenous ligands, the same epigenetic changes. Uh, so I'm just repeating the question for the colleagues uh, online. So the question is whether pattern recognition receptors, toll like receptors, and so on could induce similar type of changes by recognition of endogenous ligands. And unfortunately, they can. And I'm saying unfortunately because there are situations in which we do not want this to happen. And, and the first study that we have done in collaboration with, uh, with colleagues uh, from Eike Latz uh, group in Bonn is that we hypothesize that something like that could happen, for example, in, uh, in Western type diets. And, and we gave mice uh, for a month Western type diet, and then we put them back on, on normal diet for two months. And we observed that the level of bone marrow and immune response is actually that even if the mice, if they were exposed for one month, so the Western type diet that exposed to all the oxidized lipids and all the endogenous ligands released uh, during uh, during the Western type diet, even if we put them on on healthy diet, let's say for two months, the long term epigenetic and immunological changes persist. So this is happening indeed. That is why, unfortunately, probably this happens in us too. And uh, this is one of the hypotheses that be, is being studied now by several groups. Is that for example, the yo-yo diet that, so for example, people gaining weight and then losing 10 kilos and then getting more. And, and it is known that this, this type of, uh, of uh, yo-yo weight actually is worse actually for, uh, for atherosclerosis than actually having continuously a, 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 a high, high weight might be induced through these processes of, of, uh, uh, of, um, of heating repeatedly. Uh, the immune cells. So, unfortunately, yes, that happens. So, in your experiment, when you actually injected the BCG vaccine, I will get the bone marrow, the change in the cell in bone marrow. I'm just wondering, like, those, those are adults, I guess. Yes. So, 
everybody from the childhood and adolescent age, they go through the vaccination program, which is in the country. So we all had 20, 25 vaccination in our life. Why the BCG vaccine is so special and not other vaccines are doing the job? There's something which I don't understand why. Well, first of all, there are many vaccines, as I mentioned. It's not only uh, only uh, BCG. There is also measles vaccine, oral polio vaccine, influenza vaccine now, Shingrix vaccine, actually. It depends very much on whether they are adjuvanted or not, and what type of adjuvant, and what type of immunological signaling they induce. Mm -hmm. And um, we see that, for example, the vaccines that use alum, and alum is, is something that is used in most of the modern type vaccines because it's inducing very good antibody responses. Those vaccines generally do not induce strain immunity and rather tend to inhibit it. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, vaccines that use live attenuated microorganisms or they use other types of, uh, of, um, of uh, adjuvants such as ASO1, ASO3 that are newer adjuvants used by GSK, for example, they are they are actually inducing train immunity and there are new data showing them very strongly. So it, it depends on the type of stimulation, the type of adjuvants especially that are present in the vaccine. Okay. And the last question, the specificity and innate immunity, I think that in 2007 in Schneider's lab, they, they published the gross biogen paper where they showed they can immunize uh, drosophila against the S then or whatever. And actually, this was very specific. The response was yeah. only against these bacteria. Yes. And the right. population is much longer and yes. distant infection. And I, I think that they actually are saying that some pathogen can have a specific response, which is not then uh, sort of uh, the might the the the, 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 the will not be resistant. In sort of general resistance, but specific. So, how is it with specificity in this response? Right? So, because you usually say it's non specific response, but yes, uh, but there are, yes, no, but I think that there are different processes, and these epigenetic processes are in principle non specific. They are not completely non specific, they are semi specific. They depend, the specificity is given by the specificity of the initial transcription factor where, which was activated. There is a specificity There is a specificity in the transcription factor which activates certain genes. And if we activate certain transcription factors during the first infection or vaccines, it's those genes, specifically those genes, which are, which are changed, not everything. So that is the specificity given at epigenetic level. However, what you describe for Drosophila, I'm convinced that is a different mechanism. And actually there were some other studies and I forgot that they described a family of receptors, which are several hundred, if not thousands of them present in certain uh, insects. And I forgot their name, which provide actually specificity. But that is very different. And, and I do think when, when we look here, I do think that there are here also receptor uh, uh, receptor families that probably give specificity and a type of true adaptive immune response also in invertebrates. I, I do think that they must be there. But so the receptors do not exist in mammals, I guess. Probably not. Probably not. Yes, Jim. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, um, no, a brilliant talk. And actually, I was really, I loved your answer to Bart's question. And I love Bart's question about the connectivity because it's almost sort of a point, you know, that I that I, I want to make is that is that all of this in mammals is happening in the context of an adaptive immune system. It's impossible to disconnect the two. And it actually, listening to you and listening to talk made me wonder if, if maybe, you know, the, the adaptive immune system was evolutionarily incredibly successful, right? It just radiated very quickly. And maybe one of the reasons it was so successful is is the ability its ability to control these innate memory responses that that they are in their own way kind of dangerous without specificity and so you know even the training you describe is in the context of T cells that have been there before um, and and so one of the questions you know more specific question is you know you raise the issue of antigen presentation do you see changes in dendritic cell development in the bone marrow you know. Um, we are we are doing now single cell sequencing of this uh, in the same study, and hopefully we will be able to uh, to address that question. I can't answer right now because we are literally uh, sequencing now uh, the bone marrows, 
but I would guess that there are uh, changes. There must be changes also in the dendritic cells. And, and indeed, as you say, um, the impact of adaptive immune responses on the trained immunity is very strong. Yeah. We see that if we eliminate interferon gamma, for example, yeah. we see a very strongly downregulated response. I mean, I'm finding it in my own work is, you know, the, I'm working on macrophages, but I can't avoid the immune system. It's, you know. yes. On a completely um, other question on your generational responses, you indicated at the, at the very end that it was males who'd been vaccinated with BCG, but I wondered in your mouse experiments, was there a sex issue with the transgenerational? Did it matter whether it was the mother or the father who a mouse that was... We did only the, the fathers and oh, we went to three generations just to avoid, let's say, uh, um, uh, uterine right. impacts uh, during the infection, right. just to exclude that. Right. But uh, there are uh, there are some beautiful studies published, actually uh, done with with male mice and an impact on on the next generation, so intergenerational effects right. that show that that is happening as well. Yeah. And I I was I would think, and actually the uh, the human studies that have been shown uh, with a with a BCG scar. Actually, the same effect in, in women is much stronger than in men. Right. So in the end, in women, it's even stronger. Yeah, I mean, we're just about to submit a paper where, they, well, actually, it, it's it's not my lab, but it's my postdoc, um, um, the gamma delta cells. So if you have gamma delta knockout mice, uh, it really matters whether the mother is gamma delta knockout versus the father. Uh, oh, that's and that's because, but it turns out it's because during the birth, the microbiome gets passed on um, and that's determined by probably the vaginal gamma delta cells. And so it really, you know, in all our mouse experiments, it can matter what knockout, you know, whether yeah. it's the, yeah. So. Very interesting. So, yeah, I, I would like to take a question from Zoom now, Alisha. Can you... Uh, Hi, uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the splendid talk. Uh, my question would be uh, the next. Um, it has been described that tolerance uh, is also happening in the immune cells against stimulations uh, with, for example, LPS, which is also driven by its own epigenetic reprogramming. But LPS is also described to produce immune training. So um, what kind of criteria is followed in the immune cells to decide whether to produce tolerance or immune training against a um, specific antigen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is a very good question. And, and the answer is twofold, basically. Uh, one is, conceptually speaking, I think that there are very little, if any, differences between tolerance and training, because in both processes, uh, there are genes that go up and genes, genes that go down. Also in train immunity process, we tend to look at the genes that go up, but there are also genes that go down. Uh, however, immunologically speaking, we divide the, the training and, and the tolerance based on the way that that organism responds to an infection with an increased response, increased mm -hmm. protection, and so on. So it's, it's more a functional definition rather than... Um, let's say conceptual definition at the level of, of gene transcription level. Um, that being said, and then moving to, uh, to LPS, indeed, LPS has been shown to induce both training and tolerance. Uh, and at immunological level, these differences are given basically by the dose of LPS that is used. And this is true also for other stimuli. If you use small or moderate amounts of LPS or beta-glucan for that matter, or peptidoglycans, uh, from uh, from mycobacteria, you obtain training basically. But if you give a very uh, a very large amount of stimulus, and LPS, even if you don't give a large amount, is a much stronger stimulus uh, for the cell than beta glucans or peptidoglycans, uh, at orders of ma magnitude more potent. Uh, then you induce tolerance, and that has to do with the strength of the metabolic processes that are inducing the cell. When you, when you, for example, induce a very strong uh, uh, cellular uh, metabolic response in the cell by LPS, by high dose of LPS or high dose of uh, beta-glucan, you also uh, accumulate NAD plus in the cell, which activates strongly sirtuins, which are histone deacetylases, 
that completely shut down the, the gene transcription. So it has to do actually with the strength of the response. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, uh, Miguel, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Mihai, I'm really sorry that I cannot be uh, present in Martin and colleagues. Uh, unfortunately, my flight got uh, canceled. Mihai, fantastic talk. I have two interrelated questions. First, you the, the product of the of these epigenetic modifications that you uh, that are suffering in innate immune cells is a change in resistance to infection. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether, as a whole organism, uh, parenchyma cells um, that are not directly involved in resistance to infection might also acquire this type of memory in a way that the whole organism becomes more resilient, uh, let's call it like that, to a, uh, a future infection. Would you like to comment about that? Do you think it's possible? It's speculative. But, uh, yes, I think it's, it's an excellent question. And I, I, I do think that this is possible and it, it is related also with an, uh, with an earlier question also on cross-generational level, but also within, within one organism is very well possible that indeed the, the overall resilience of the organism, maybe in metabolic processes in the liver or whatever are, are changed. And, and that would be actually very exciting to, to look at. Um, but I think it's very well possible, yes. And the other, if you allow me, just very briefly, I think it's a complex uh, question, but um, so these epigenetic modifications are imposed, as you've shown and confirmed by many other labs, by changes in metabolism, let's call it generically like that. Mm -hmm. But there are so many, uh, so metabolism is always changing and adapting. So this cannot be the whole mechanism. So I was wondering whether to impose this type of memory, let's call it like that, whether these immune cells also use a, a, two, a two signaling system that you modify metabolism, but you need to have a second signal to say, okay, you modify metabolism in this context and that's why you're gonna do this. Oh, response. absolutely, absolutely. Actually, maybe, maybe I didn't explain it good enough. And I think that indeed, based on your question, I didn't do that, but uh, I see the metabolic changes as a, yes, adjunctive basically to the, uh, to the initial, initial immunological signaling and epigenetic processes taking place because the initial, initial change, which is taking place in the cell, initial, uh, in, in, initial, initial epigenetic transformations uh, during the first uh, challenge, are not metabolic in nature, they, they, they happen pretty quickly. Actually, the later metabolic processes um, modulate actually the recovery from that and allow the persistence of a certain, uh, of a certain yeah. epigenetic signature. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so we have three questions in the room. Uh, I've noted them and two questions in the chat. So let's see what we can do, Michaela. I saw you can, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a great talk and very inspiring. Actually, I would like to follow on uh, this metabolic aspect uh, that uh, you nicely showed that this uh, uh, PCG vaccination uh, is nicely of uh, uh, protection against the infection disease. Uh, is it known that uh, it could also uh, Improve, like, you know, the uh, uh, resistance against the metabolic uh, disease such as obesity, diabetes, because uh, these, um, you know, um, diseases are also uh, characterized by increased uh, pro-inflammatory response. So, uh, if this vaccination could help, like, you know, to prevent against this, uh, or if it has been already done, I don't know. Yes, there, there was some studies done by uh, Denise Faustman in, in Harvard, in which she actually uh, vaccinated individuals and looked at the impact on diabetes, for example. And there are colleagues in Italy who have looked on the impact of BCG vaccination on uh, multiple sclerosis. Well, that is more immunological. Um, and uh, Denise Faustman reported indeed improvement of, of, uh, uh, of diabetes and insulin sensitivity. Um, I would like, however, to be very honest, to see more studies and, and more in depth and with larger numbers of individuals and more in depth uh, 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 
more in-depth uh, uh, mechanistic studies because at least now it's not very clear how that would work. Uh, I would have been afraid myself that that in terms of of, um, of metabolic processes might might work in in the other direction. For example, you can also envisage a process in which in which uh, inflammatory processes are upregulated and and that uh, that could be deleterious. Uh, fortunately, we have done our studies ourselves, and in 300 individuals looked very carefully. On on on, uh, on the on the inflammatory and metabolic processes, and we do not see that happening. But but this is still in infancy, and I think more more studies need to be done. All right. So yes, please go ahead. Thank you for the talk. We even changed our general general immunology lecture. The first slide, because the distinction between innate and adaptive is somehow profoundly questioned. Uh, my question is uh, pointing to the to the metabolism itself. Uh, did you look on the autophagy? Because it could be a very simple answer to majority of the phenomena you you observe. And the other is: is there any any space for potential artifacts based on on a use of SDF mice? Uh, uh, looking on people living in Western civilization because maybe the normal situation that there is an open gap for programming during the childhood, being exposed to all the all the patterns, and then doing the same immunization, there would be no no effect later on. So one probably simple answer. The other is more yeah. more. Uh, let me think. The first question was about autophagy. autophagy. Yes, we looked actually at autophagy and uh, and uh, BCG because uh, autophagy is also crucial as an antimicrobial effect, and it is important. And we also observed, for example, that polymorphisms which affect autophagy downregulate the induction of train immunity by BCG and actually downregulate its uh, clinical effects in bladder cancer as well. Uh, regarding the second part of the question, I do actually think that probably the BCG effects are stronger in in young children than the uh, than in the adults. Um, well, their immune system has been exposed to much fewer things. The BCG is administered at birth, so the chances that BCG would induce a certain change, sending the cells in a certain direction, I think, is much higher than in the adults. Who have been exposed during their lifetimes to many other things. Um, we have not shown that yet, let's say practically, just to compare in the same study. But my feeling would be that that is the case indeed. And we see also stronger effects epidemiologically in children, actually, than we see in the adults when we revaccinate. So I think there was another question. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> A very nice study talk. I um, have a special interest in your epigenetic profile, pro reprogramming. And I'd like to piggyback off of uh, what Sophie mentioned. Uh, maybe you're giving away some trade secrets in your laboratory, but my first question would be I'm uh, happy to do that. <laughs> well, we should talk later. But I was wondering if you generated a uh, epigenetic profile of the innate immune cells. Uh, DNA methylation or histone modification profile of those cells of macrophages, neutrophils, basophils. Have you generated a profile of those cells after infection? After BCG vaccination or after? Yeah, yes. Yeah. General infections, we have not done it. Uh, you mentioned often, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. You mentioned often only histone modification. And you talked briefly about DNA methylation. At the promoter, or it's at uh, long non coding RNA, but I'm wondering what changes you see in those cells at the promoter when infection occurs. Yeah. And what type of infection do you refer to? Well, I, I, I really don't, I don't know. I just took from the point that you said that after infection, yeah. there would be system modification. Well, other my point is there could be various generate uh, various modifications that occur. Absolutely. In innate new they, they do actually, and there are other colleagues of us who have done that work. We haven't worked ourselves. So DNA methylation after BCG has been done by colleagues in Australia. Beautiful work published two months ago in Science Advances. There is work done by uh, Andrew DiNardo, uh, who did this type of uh, studies after TB infection. Uh, 
and we may see a change and a promote an appellation of say macrophages before and after this infection. Well, I don't know exactly precisely all the all the details of, of, of their results. I think, of course, if we talk about macrophages itself, it's tough to get macrophages from people. We have to think what type of macrophages, uh, alveolar macrophages, well, to do a ball in so, multiple and six. So we want to know the status of these certain macrophages. People have done mostly uh, using cells in the circulation, so monocytes or sometimes dendritic cells, or uh, and we have done some work on neutrophils. So mostly using innate immune cells from the circulation rather than from tissues. Uh, but it would be very interesting indeed to, to be able to collect uh, tissue macrophages themselves. But as far as I know, that has not been done yet because of the practical issues in humans, of course. Okay, uh, so there are a few questions. I mean, we are out of time, but uh, let me just uh, quickly read, should be maybe um, not take too much time. Is there documented or do you expect different impact of MRR A vaccines on uh, non-specific immunity in contrast to other vaccines? Well, um, there has been published already, actually. There is, um, is, is not actually put as such in the title. But there is a paper from Bali Pulendran in cell uh, beginning of the year with single cell sequencing post uh, uh, BioNTech Pfizer messenger RNA vaccines clearly showing uh, long term changes in innate immune cells, probably even stronger than adaptive immune cells. And uh, the messenger RNA platform is a highly inflammatory platform. So it would have been expected and, and they have shown it. It's, it's a nature paper published beginning of the year. Yeah. Um, do you know what uh, what is the implication of training immunity in adaptive cell therapy for cancer? For example, in the use of monocyte-derived dendritic cells for neoantigen-based vaccines. Uh, well, if if we think that we modify the function of uh, dendritic cells, well, we can call it also training immunity. It's fine. We we have ourselves approaches of, of building uh, nanobiologics which induce training immunity for safe use in humans to reprogram the, uh, the immunosuppressive myeloid cells from cancer. And in mice, at least, works very nicely. So we are developing them now for humans and hopefully we'll know whether it works in a couple of years. All right. So there is a next question, um, which would be best left for the panel discussion. But, you know, that's a bit problematic. So let me just go ahead and ask it. What do you think are the next big, big questions on a conceptual level for trained immunity? <laughs> okay. Uh, how much time do we have? Because there are many questions. I think some of them have been beautifully, beautifully asked actually by uh, by colleagues here. Interaction actually between different types of immune cells. I think this would be one of the most important things. How do they interact and um, uh, at at systemic level? What is the role, for example, of stromal cells in the bone marrow? This is something that has not been uh, uh, looked at yet. To look in more depth into the different pathologies, to understand the different uh, the interaction between different epigenetic processes. How much is chromatin uh, accessibility important? How much is DNA methylation? What is the role of low no coding RNAs and so on? So there are at multiple level a lot of work to do. Is is a very is, this is a very young field, yeah. So we have many questions to answer. Yeah, thanks. I, I don't think Adam uh, like it has a, a, a question. Um, no? Okay. So, so let me just uh, thank again for the talk.